Ashley Brock Green, Nora Roberts' book, Sea Swept, Chapter 14. It was a good spring afternoon, balmy air, fine wind, and just enough cloud cover to filter the sun and keep it from baking your flesh down to your bones. When Ethan got at his work boat in the dock, the waterfront was busy with tourists. Come to see the watermen work and the busy fingers of the crab pickers fly. He had wrecked. He had reached his quota early, which suited him fine. The water tanks under the faded strip, all we know of his boat, were crawling with annoying crabs that would find their way into the pot by nightfall. It would turn in his catch and leave his mate to diddle, to diddle with the engine. It was running just a tough, tad rough. He planned to take himself over to the building to see how the plumbing was coming. He was itching to have it done, and Ethan Quinn wasn't a man who itched for much, at least. He didn't allow himself to think he did, but the boat building enterprise was a little private dream that he nurtured, that he nurtured from some time now. He thought it was about ripe. Simon let out one sharp, happy wolf, wolf, as the boat bumped the pillars. Even as Ethan prepared to secure the lines, there were hands reaching for them, hands he recognized before he lifted his gaze to the face. Long, pretty hands that wore no rings or polish. I've got it, Ethan. He looked up and smiled. Oh, Grace, appreciate it. What you doing on the docks midday? Picking crabs. Bessie was feeling off this morning, so they were short a pair of hands. My mother wanted Aubrey for a couple of hours anyway. You ought to take some time off for yourself, Grace. Oh, she secured the lines expertly. She straightened her run a hand through her short cap pair. One of these days, did you all finish up that ham caster on me the other day? Fought over the last bite. It was great. Thanks. Now now that he'd about run out of easy conversation was standing on dark beside her, he didn't know what to do with his hands. To compensate, he, he scratched Simon and said, We pulled in a nice catch today. So I see. But her smile didn't reach her eyes. She was not on her lip. She was sign, he did not. That what, that what was on Grace's mind was trouble. This is her problem. I hate to take up your time when you're busy, Ethan. Her eyes skinned the doctor. Could you walk with me a minute? Sure. I could use something cold. Jim, you handle things from here, all right? You got it, Captain. With the dog trotting between them, he's tucked his hands in his pocket. He nodded with a familiar voice, called out a greeting, barely noticing the quick fingers of the crab pickers who put on quick choke while they worked. He noticed the smells because he was so fond of them. Water, fish, salt in the air. The subtle notes of Grace's soap and shampoo. Ethan, I don't want to cause you or your family any grief. You couldn't, Grace. You may already know. It just bothers me so much. I just hate it so much. Her voice lowered. This isn't what temper that he said it was rare. So all that her face was set, her mouth grim, and he decided to forego that cold drink and lead her further away from the docks. You better tell me. Get it off your mind. And put it on yours, she said with a sigh. She hated to do it. Ethan was always there. If he had trouble or needed a shoulder, what she wished he would offer her more than a shoulder, but she learned to accept the way things were. It's best that you know, she said after herself. You can't deal with things unless you know. There's an investigator for the insurance company talking to people, asking questions about your father, about Seth, too. Ethan laid a hand on her arm briefly. They were far away from the docks, from the storefronts, and the jangle traffic. So he thought they were done with that. What kind of questions? About your daddy's state of mind the last few weeks before his accident. About him bringing Seth home. He came to see me this morning. First thing, I thought it was better to talk to him than not. She looked at Ethan. Relieved when he nodded. I told him Ray Quinn was one of the finest men I've ever known. Gave him a piece of my mind about going around trying to pick up nasty gossip. Because he just smiled at, at her lip skirt. Well, he made me so mad. Claims he's only doing his job and his manners mild as skim milk. But he bothered me, especially when he asked if I knew anything about Seth's mother or where he'd come from. I told him I didn't that it didn't matter. Seth was where he's supposed to be. That was that. Oh, did the right thing. You did just fine. Her eyes were the color of stormy seas now. The emotions curved through her. Ethan, I know it'll hurt some people. It'll hurt if some people talk, and some of them say things they've got no business saying. It doesn't mean anything. She continued to took his hand in hers. Not to anyone who knows your family. We'll get through it. He gave her hands a quick squeeze. I didn't know if he should hold on to them or let go. I'm glad you told me. He let go, 
But he kept looking at her face. Looked so long. The color began to rise in her feet. You're not getting enough sleep, he said. Your eyes are tired. Oh, embarrassed, annoyed. She brushed her fingertips out of them. Why was it the man only seemed to notice if something was wrong with her? Aubrey was a little fussy last night. I've got to get back, she said quickly. Gave the patient Simon a quick call. I'll be by the house tomorrow to clean. He hurried off. She hurried off, thinking hopelessly that a man who only noticed when you looked tired or troubled would never pay you any mind as a woman. But Ethan watched her walk away. Thought she was too damn pretty to work herself like a mule. The inspector's name was Mackenzie, and he was making a round. So far, his notes contained descriptions of a man who was a saint with a halo as wide and bright as the sun, a selfless Samaritan of a man who not only loved his neighbors, but cheerfully bore their burdens, who had with his faithful wife beside him saved large chunks of humanity, kept the world safe for democracy. His other notations termed Raymond Quinn a preposterous, interfering, hollering, than thou despot who collected bad young boys like old men collecting stamps and used them to provide him with slave labor, an ego bomb, and would possibly predict sexual favors. Though Mackenzie had to admit the latter was more interesting, that view had come from only a scattered few. Being a man of details and caution, he realized that the truth probably lay somewhere in between the saint and the sinner. His purpose wasn't to canalize or condoned one Raymond Quinn, policy number 005678LQ2, it was simply to gather facts, and those facts would determine whether the claim against that policy would be paid or disputed. Either way, Mackenzie got paid for his time and his efforts. He stopped off and grabbed a sandwich at a little grease spot called Bayside Eats. He had a weakness for grease, bad coffee, and waitresses with names like Lula Bell, who was why at age 58 he was 20 pounds overweight, 25 if he didn't tip the scale a few notches. Back from zero before he stepped on it, had a chronic case of indigestion and was twice divorced. He was also balding and had bunions and an ear tooth that ached like a bitch in the heat. Mackenzie knew he was no physical prize, but he knew his job. Had 32 years with true life insurance, kept records as clean as a nun's heart. He pulled his four tours into the pitted gravel lot beside the building. His last contact, a little worm named Claremont, had given him directions. Found he would find Cameron Quinn there. Claymont had told him with a tight lipped smile. Mac Mac Mackenzie had disliked the man after five minutes in his company. The inspector had worked with people long enough to recognize greed, envy, and simple malice, even when they were layered out with charm. Claymore didn't have any layers that Mackenzie hadn't noticed. He was all smarm. He belched up a memory of the dill pickle relish he indulged in at lunch, shook his head, and summed out his hourly dose of Zantac. There was a pickup truck in the lot and had a stand in a spiffy class Corvette. Mackenzie... Mackenzie liked the look of that better, though he wouldn't have gotten behind the wheel of one of those death traps for love or money. No, indeed, but he admired it anyway, as he hauled himself out of his car. He could admire the looks of the man as well, he mused, when a pair of them stepped out of the building. Not the older one with a red checkered shirt and clip-on tie. Paper pusher decided he was good at recognizing types. The younger one was too lean, too hungry, too sharp-eyed to spend much time pushing papers. He didn't work with his hands, McKenzie thought he could, and he looked like a man who knew what he wanted and found a way to make it happen. This was Cameron Quinn. McKenzie decided that Ray Quinn had had his hands full while he was alive. Cam spotted McKenzie when he walked the plumbing inspector out. He was feeling better. Good about the progress. Figured it would take another week to complete the bathroom, but he and Ethan could do without that little convenience that much longer. Uh, he wanted to get started, and since the wiring was done, and that too had passed inspection, there was no need to wait. Tack McKenzie has some sort of paper jockey, jingling in his memory. He tried to recall if he had an appointment, another appointment set up, but he didn't think so. Sounds something he imagined. As McKenzie and the inspector passed each other, the man had a briefcase. Cam nodded wearily. When people carried a briefcase, there was something inside they wanted to talk, take out. You'd be Mr. Quinn, McKenzie said, his voice a fat, affable, his eyes measured. I would. I'm McKenzie, true life insurance. We've got insurance. Or he's nearly sure they did. My brother Philip handles those kind of details. Then it clicked. Cam's stance shifted from Lex over. True life. 
That's the one. I'm going to investigate it for the company. We need to clear up some questions. For your claim on your father's policy, Kim Bezo. He's dead. Kim himself out. Isn't that the question, Mackenzie? I'm sorry for your loss. I imagine the insurance company is sorry it has to show up. As far as I'm concerned, my father paid into that policy in good faith. The trick is you have to die to win. He died. It was warm in the sun. The pastrami on right with spicy mustard was a settling well. Mackenzie blew out of my There's some questions about the actor. Car meets telephone pole. Telephone pole wheels. Trust me, I do a lot of driving. Mackenzie nodded. Under other circumstances, you might have apprehended Cam's no bullshit tone. You be aware that the policy has a suicide clause. My father didn't commit suicide, Mackenzie. Since you weren't in the car with him at the time, it's going to be tough for you to prove otherwise. Your father was under a great deal of stress, emotional uphill. Came from my father raised three badasses, taught a bunch of snot nosed college kids. He had a great deal of stress and emotional uphill all his life. And he taken on a fourth. That's right. Cam tucked his thumb in the front pockets. His stance became a silent challenge. That doesn't have anything to do with you or your company. As it bears on the circumstances of your father's accident, there's a question of possible blackmail and certainly threat to his reputation. A copy of the letter found in his car at the scene. When McKees opened his briefcase, Tim Cam took his over. I've seen the letter. All it means is there's a woman out there with the maternal instinct of a rabid alley cat. You try to say the Ray Quinn smashed into that pole because he was afraid some two-bit bitch will bury your insurance company. Fury thought he'd already passed through spare, spring back, full-blown in face sharp. I don't give I don't give a goddamn about the money. We can make it on our own. True life wants to welsh on the deal. That's my brother's area and the lawyers. But you or anybody else messing with my father's rep, you'll deal with me. The man was a good 25 years younger. Mackenzie calculated, though, as tough as a brick and mad as a starving wolf. Thought it decided it would be passed around. If you change that, Mr. Clean, I have no interest or desire to smear your father's reputation. True life's a good company. Worked for them most of my life. Try to warn us. This is just routine. I don't like your routine. I can understand that. The great area is, is the accident itself. The medical reports confirm that your father was in good physical shape. There's no evidence of heart attack, stroke, physical reason that would have caused him to lose control of his car. Single car accident, an empty stretch of road, on a dry, clean day. The accident, reconstruction experts, findings were inconclusive. That's your problem. Camp spotted Seth walking down the road from the direction of school. And there he saw his mind. I can't help you with it, but I can tell you that my father faces problems square on. He never took the easy way. I've got work to do. Leaving it at that, Cam turned away and walked towards Seth. Mackenzie rubbed eyes that were tearing up from the sunlight. Quinn might have thought he'd added nothing to the report, but he was wrong. Nothing else. Mackenzie could be sure that Quinn would fight for the claim to the better end, if not for the money, for the memory. Who's that guy? Set the ass as he watched McKenzie head back to his seat. Some men's shirts quack. Cam nodded toward the street. Two boys loaded in a pile and half a block away. Who's those guys? Who are those guys? Seth gave a careless glance over his shoulder. Well, I don't know. Just kids from school? They're nobody. They're hassling you? Nah. Are we going up on the roof? Roof's done. Cam murmured and watched with some amusement as the two boys wanted closer, trying to fail and to look disinterested. Hey, you kids. What are you doing? Said his mortified. Relax. Come on over here. Cam orders both boys froze like statues. What the hell are you calling them over for? They're just jerks from school. I could use some jerk labor. Cam said mildly. It occurred to him Seth could use some companions of his own age. He waited while Seth squirmed. The two boys held fast, whispering consultation. Ender was the taller of the two, squaring his shoulders, swagging down the road on his b battered Nikes. We weren't doing anything. The boys set a start of defiance, slightly spoiled by a list from a missing tube. I can see that. You want to do something. The boy slid his horn eyes to the younger kid, then over his head, then cautiously up to Cam's face. Maybe? You got a name? Sure, I'm Danny. This is my kid brother, Will. I turned 11 last week. He's only nine. I'll be 10 in 10 months. Will stated and wrapped his brother in the ribs with his elbow. He still goes to elementary. Daddy put him in with a smear. <laughs> this general stare was at baby school. I'm not a baby. <laughs> At Will's fist, as Will's fist was already clenched and lifted, Cam took hold of it. 
and lightly goes his over. Seems strong enough to me. I'm plenty strong. Well, told him. And grand with the charm of an angelic host. Oh, we'll see about that. See all this crap piled up around here. Old shingles, tar paper, trash. Can't serve it the area himself. You see that dumpster over there? The crap goes in the dumpster. You get five bucks. Each? Then he piped up. Saves wise, glitter in a freckle face. Don't make me laugh, kid. But you get a two dollar bonus if you do it without me having to come out and break up any fights. He shook the thumb and said, He's in charge. The minute Cam left him alone, Danny turned to set. They sized each other up in narrow eyes house. I saw he punch Robert. So he shifted his balance evenly. It would be two against one. He calculated, but he was prepared for fight. So what? It was cool. It was all Danny said and began to pick up the orange shingles. Will grinned happily up in the session. Robert is a big fart fart. And fat. Daddy said you when you socked him he bled and bled. Seth found himself grinning back. Like a stuck pig. Like or Wilson died. We can buy ice cream with the money up at Crawford. Yeah, maybe. Seth started to gather up your ass with Will cheerfully docking his heels. And it wasn't having a good day. She started out the morning running her last pair of hose before she even got out her front door. She was out of bagels and yogurt, and she admitted almost every damn thing because she'd been spending too much time with Cam, thinking about Cam, to keep to her usual marketing routine. When she stopped off to mail a letter to her grandparents, she chipped a nail on the mailbox. Her phone was already ringing when she walked into her office at 8.30. The hysterical woman on the other end was demanding to know why she had to yet receive her medical cart. She claimed the woman down. She got the woman down shorter as she would see to the matter personally, and simply because she was there, the switchboard pa passed through a whiny old man who insisted his neighbors were child abusers because they allowed their offspring to watch television every night of the week. Television, he told her, is a tool the communists left. Nothing but sex and murder, sex and murder, subliminal messages. I read all about it. I'm going to look into this, Mr. Bimby. She promised and opened her top door, where she kept her asking. You better try the cops, but they don't do nothing. These kids doomed. Going to need to deprogram them. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. My duty as American. You bet. Anna muttered after he hung up. Knowing that she was doing family court at 2 that afternoon, she booted up her computer. Intended to call up the file to retrieve her reports and notes. When the message flashed across the screen that her program had committed an illegal act. She didn't bother to scream. She simply sat back, closed her eyes, and accepted that it was going to be a lousy day. <coughs> it got worse. She knew her testimony in court was key. The Higgins case file had come across her desk nearly a year ago. Three, three children's. Three children, ages eight, six, and four, had all been physically and emotionally abused. The wife, barely 25, was a textbook case of the battered spouse. She left her husband countless times over the years, but she always went back. Six months before, Anna had worked hard and looked long to get her and her children into a shelter. The woman had stayed less than 36 hours before changing her mind, though Anna's heart ached for her. It had come down to the welfare of the children. They pinched faces, the bruises, their pinched faces, the bruises, the fear, and worse, the dull acceptance in their eyes tormented her. They were in foster care with a couple who was generous enough and strong enough to take all of them. Seeing those foster parents flanking the three damaged boys, she found, she vowed she would do everything in her power to keep them there. Counseling was recommended in January of last year when this case first came to my attention. Anna stated from the witness stand, both family and individually. The recommendation was not taken, nor was it taken in May of that same year when Mrs. Higgins was hospitalized with a dislocated jaw and other injuries, or in September when Michael Higgins, the eldest boy, suffered a broken hand. In November of that year, Mrs. Higgins and her two oldest sons were all treated in ADR for various injuries. I was notified it. Notified and assisted Mrs. Higgins and her children in a secure, securing a place in a woman's shelter. She did not remain there two full days. You've been caseworker of record on this matter for more than a year. The lawyer stood in front of her, knowing from experience it wasn't necessary to guide her testimony. Yes, more than a year. And she felt the failure keenly. What is the current status? On February 6th of this year, a police unit responding to the call from a neighbor 
found Mr. Higgins under the influence of alcohol. Mrs. Higgins was reported as hysterical and requiring medical attention for facial bruises and lacerations. Curtis, the youngest child, had a broken arm. Mr. Higgins was taken into custody at the time, as I was, the caseworker of record, I was notified. Did you see Mrs. Higgins and the children on that day? The lawyer asked her. Yes, I drove up to the hospital and spoke with Mrs. Higgins. She claimed that Curtis had fallen down the stairs. Due to the nature of his injuries and the history of the case, I didn't believe her. The attending physician in the ER shared my opinion. The children were taken into foster care where they have remained since that date. She continued to answer questions about the status of the case file, the children themselves. Once she drew a smile out of the middle boy, she spoke of the t-ball team had he'd been able to join. They un then Anna prepared herself for the irritation and tendom of cross-examination. Are you aware that Mr. Higgins has voluntarily entered into an alcohol rehabilitation program? And, uh, Anna spared one glance at the Higginson's pro bono lawyer and looked directly into, her into the father's eyes. I'm aware that over the past year, Mr. Higgins has claimed to have entered a rehabilitation program no less than three times. She saw the hate and fury, fury darken his face. Let him hate me, she thought. She'd be damned if he would lay hands on those children again. I'm aware that he's never completed a program. Alcoholism is a disease, Miss Finelli. Mr. Higgins is now seeking treatment for his illness. You would agree that Mr. Mrs. Higgins has been a victim of her husband's illness? I would agree that she has suffered both physically and emotionally at his hands. And you could possibly believe that she should suffer further, lose her children, and they her. Can you possibly believe that the court should take these three little boys away from the mother? The choice Anna thought was hers, the man who beat her and terrorized their children on the health and safety of those children. I believe she will suffer further until she makes the decision to change her circumstances, and it's my professional opinion that Mrs. Higgins is incapable of caring for herself, much less her children, at this time. Both Mr. and Mrs. Higgins now have steady employment. The lawyer continued. Mrs. Higgins has stated on her oath that she and her husband have reconciled and continued to work on their marital differences. Separating the family will, as she stated, only cause emotional pain for all involved. I know she believes that. Her steady look at Mrs. Higgins was compassionate, but her voice was firm. I believe that there are three children whose welfare and safety are at stake. I'm aware of the medical reports, the physics psychiatric reports, the police reports. The past 15 months, these three children have been treated in the emergency room a combined, to a combined total of 11 times. She looked at the lawyer now, wondering how he could stand in court of a law, fight for what was surely the destruction of three young boys. I'm aware that a four-year-old boy's arm was snapped like a twig. I strongly recommend that these children remain in licensed and supervised foster care to ensure their physical and emotional safety. No charges have been filed against Mr. Higgins. No, no charges have been filed. Anna shifted her gaze to the mother. Let it rest on that tired face. That's just another crime, she murmured. When she's finished, Anna passed by the Higginsons without a glance. But behind the rail, little Curtis reached out for him. Do you have a lollipop? He whispered, making her smile. She made a habit of carrying them for him. He had a weakness for cherry tootsie roll pops. Maybe I do. Let's see. She was reaching into her purse when the explosion came from behind her. Get your hands off what's mine, you bitch. As she started to turn, Higgins hit her full force, knocking her sprawling and sending Curtis to the floor with her in a heap of screams and wails. Her head rang like church bells. Stairs dazed. Her stars dazzled her eyes. She could hear screams and curses as she managed to push herself up to her knees. Her cheek ached fiercely where it had connected with the seat of a wooden chair. Her palms sank from skidding up skidding on the tile floor, and damn it, the new, the new hose she had bought to replace the one she run were torn at the knees. Hold still, Marlowe ordered. She was crouching in his office, grimly doctoring scrapes. I'm all right. I did the injuries were minor. It was worth it. That little demonstrating in open court assures that he won't get near those kids for quite a while. You worry me, Anna. Marlowe looked up with those dark gleaming eyes. I'm I don't must think you enjoy being tackled by that 200-pound putz. I enjoyed the results. Ouch, Marlo! She blew out of breath as the supervisor rose to examine the bruise on Anna's cheek. I enjoy filing charges for assault, and most of all, I enjoy seeing those kids go home with their foster family. A good day's work. 
with a shade of red, Marlowe stepped back. It worries me, too, that you let yourself get too close. You can't help from a distance. So much of what we do is just paperwork, Marlowe, forms and procedures. But every now and again, you get to do something, even if it's only getting tackled by 200-pound putts. And it's worth it. If you care too much, you end up with more than a couple of bruises and a skinned knee. If you don't care enough, you should find another line of work. Marla blew out of breath. It was difficult to argue when she felt exactly the same. Go home, Anna. I've got another hour on the clock. Go home. Consider it combat pay. Since you put it that way, I could use the hour. I don't have anything in the house seat. If you hear any more on... She broke off and looked up at the knock on the door jam. Her eyes went, Cameron! <laughs> Miss Spinelli, I wonder if you have a minute to... A smile greeting transformed to a snarl. The light in his eyes turned hard and sharp. He flamed his word. What the hell happened to you? He was in the room, like a shot, feeling it, nearly barreling over Marlowe to get the answer. Who the hell hit you? No one exactly I was, instead of giving her a chance to finish. Little Marlowe, torn between fascination and amusement, Marlowe backed up a step, held her hands up on Not me, champ. I only browbeat my staff, never laid a finger on There was a ruckus in court, that's all, struggling to be brisk and professional despite her bare feet and legs and arrows. Marlowe, this is Cameron Quinn. Cameron, Marlo Johnston, my supervisor. It's a pleasure to meet you. Even under the circumstances, Marlo held out a hand. I was a student of your father a million years ago. I quite simply adore him. Yeah, thanks. Who is you? He debated again to Anna. <laughs> of Anna. Someone who was even out on the wrong side of a locked cell. Quickly, Anna worked her bare feet back into her high, low heeled bumps. Marlo? I'm going to take you up on that hour off. <laughs> Her only thought now was to get Cam out, away from Marlowe's curious and all too observant eyes. Cameron, if you need to speak with me about that, you can give me a ride home. She slipped on her dove gray jacket, smoothed it into place. It's not far. I'll buy you a cup of coffee. Fine, sure. When he caught her chin, saying, took of her pleasure, and alarm raged inside her. We'll talk. I'll see you tomorrow, Marlowe. Oh, yes. Marlowe smiled easily. While Anna hurried, <laughs> hurriedly gathered her briefcase. We'll talk too. End of chapter 14.